from Fox 8 Sports. This is the Black and Gold Review Show, sponsored by your Southern Quality Ford dealers, home of the best-selling truck 41 years straight, and the 2018 Nissan Titan, backed by America's best limited truck warranty. Roethlisberger takes the snap, drops back, three-man rush, throws over the middle. That ball is caught across the 40 to Bumble. 40. Ball is out! Ball is out! The ball is out! The Saints have recovered it! The ball is out! Complimentary football will do you right every time. Welcome into the Black and Gold Review Show. Deuce McAllister, Sean Vazan, I'm Juan Kincaid. All of the Saints' remaining games will be played in a place named Mercedes-Benz. We like how it's worked out. It's not bad, is it? No. Mm -mm. I'll take that every yeah. time. And so, you know, it, it was not easy. And you knew going into it, it would not be easy. But they took care of their business. They got it done on the first try, even though they had a mulligan, you know, coming up this week. But not a bad road to be able to travel when it happens in your home. Road to the Super Bowl goes to New Orleans. Always good things. Only happened one other time. And guess what? They took care of business that year. So I like the Saints' chances when they got to stay in New Orleans until they get to the Dome. So Mercedes, it's up to Super Bowl. Mercedes Benz Superdome, Mercedes Benz Stadium in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. You like the name of the places that you can go to now. And so they can keep it going. Let's get you right into the playbook. Play number one team prevails in a playoff atmosphere as loud as it's been all year long yesterday. And they came through. Definitely loud. They came through. You knew at some point they would face some adversity. And, and when it happened, you know, they were able to rise up and be able to overcome some of the bad things. I mean, because, look, this team will tell you, they didn't play perfect. You know, whether you're talking offensively, special teams, and even defensively, they did not play perfect. But at the end of the day, they made enough plays to be able to come away with a victory. Winning in different ways as well. Low scoring game the previous three weeks. This was a higher scoring game. Needed to score some points. Needed to withstand some adversity. Deuce, as you said. Uh, and I think overall, these were two, I know the uh, Steelers are on the outside looking in right now, but uh, talent-wise, these are two Super Bowl contenders. It showed, you saw the ebbs, you saw the flows, and kudos to the Saints for kind of outlasting them a little bit and making just enough plays in the end and avoiding just enough mistakes in the end to get the victory that they rightfully earned. You know, we talked leading up to this game about how being back in the Dome may help this offense get back on track. We'll talk about that in a second. But... The fact they didn't have a perfect game, but still did enough to win the football game in this setting and atmosphere, that bodes well for them going forward. Well, it definitely bodes well, I mean, because they know that, hey, look, this is how well we have to play. This is how we have to turn it up even a notch to be able to continue to compete. And I think that's probably the most important things because when you can go back and correct some of the things that you did wrong in this game and you know that, hey, look, if we play just a little bit better, we're going to be victorious. Well, look, I just think it shows resiliency, right? I mean, they, they've had to win in many different ways. Sometimes the offense, sometimes the defense. I and mean, if you really look at it, last night, special teams stepped up at certain times. So um, they've won in different ways. They're a resilient group. They don't bend to adversity. So uh, you got to like where they are right now. It's, 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 a, it's a good locker room, a good group, and you know, it shows in their record. Back into the playbook for play number two, the offense's Dome Revival. They've now won six straight games since that opening day loss against the Tampa Bay Bucks, but the offense has kind of come back around a little bit again, and we kind of thought it would in the Dome. Well, the addition of Ted Ginn Jr. and then obviously having Armstead back will definitely happy, help you. You know, you're probably looking for a little more balance as far as running the football, but you played a really good team as well. I mean, and they were determined to be able to pass the football, so you had to be able to match them kind of almost for a point for point or drive for drive there for, for a couple of series or at least a couple of quarters. Look, I, I had a feeling they would they would get a little bit of their groove back. Let's not kid ourselves because uh, after the first touchdown in the second half, up until the last touchdown they scored, they were pretty much they were they were pretty stuck there. So uh, Pittsburgh came to play obviously, but offensively, you know, they weren't playing at the level they were playing at in week five and week six. But still, uh, they were much better than they had been over the last three weeks. I thought that would happen, and hopefully, it only gets better as more games sort of circle around here inside the Superdome. Obviously, Deuce, you know about this because you were in the games, but Sean, think back to when they played Pittsburgh in the past. And the one big difference between these two teams was always the physicality that Pittsburgh bring to the game. Saints really couldn't manage a man up to that. It's, it's changed now. This team is built differently. Yeah, now. I was actually on a radio show once and they asked me about, you know, it's going to be physical, it's going to be physical. And I said, well, hold on now. 
The Saints are a physical team. Yeah. They're not getting enough credit for that. They are a very physical team at the line of scrimmage on both sides of the ball. Uh, and I think it shows. I mean, they play physical games. They play high-scoring games. And they've won the vast majority of all of them. If they had their way, they want to play bully ball. You know, mm -hmm. I think that they want to, you know, grind it out, be able to run the football, use some play action, get it to some of those skill, skill guys. But they haven't been able to a lot because they've been beat up so much up front. When you talk about being physical on defense, I think that speaks to them having the rushing, you know, being the leaders as far as whether it's yards per carry or, you know, just total yardage running the football. So they don't mind playing a physical brand of football. That may not have been the case years past. Are you surprised that this is the brand the football they play now it's kind of evolved into this way now well you look at how they've invested in those lines and the offensive and defensive lines and so I think that's where it's really paying off you know starts with Max Unger inside and then Wolford and Pete those guys set the tone and you know you have probably two of the best bookend uh, tackles in the game and then on the defensive front you know those guys they, they they have earned their pay as far as to say they're an elite group up front Look, man, when you invest, I agree 100% with what Deuce said. When you invest that much capital into both sides of the line of scrimmage, they better be dominant. And I think now, I think they are. I mean, I really think they are. It's almost like Sean Payton and the, the front office staff has admitted that, you know, we can't keep on winning games by outrunning and outpacing somebody. we got to start playing some defense and uh, keep the scores down a little bit. Anyway, back in the playbook, play number three, Pete's versatility. Andrews Pete deserves a game ball. Played three different positions in the game yesterday, left and right tackle, and left guard as well. He shows his versatility. We don't want that to be the norm, Sean, but still, we know we can do it. Yeah, he can do it in a pinch, and obviously when it happens in a game like that, you got to adjust on the fly. He was able to do so, so kudos to him because Teron Armstead went out two different times. I am a little bit concerned, though, with Armstead being out. I, I, I don't know for sure, but I would, I would think he's probably not going to play in the season finale, and who knows how much longer he would be out. It looked like he obviously re-aggravated that injury. That's an issue going into the playoffs, but when you have a guy like Andrew Speed that has that kind of versatility, at least you can survive without him. Now, I'm curious if Bushrod ends up being healthy at some point, how they played if Armstead is out, but that's a problem for a different day. Uh, yeah, it's a different a, a problem for a different day. But when you look at Pete, you know his ability to be able to play multiple positions allows you to be able to steal really a roster spot because the Saints only dress seven linemen. Normally, you know that's anywhere from seven to eight, depending on the makeup of a team. But you normally have to have a player that can play multiple positions. And you know right now with Armstead and um, Bushrod being down, Pete becomes a swing tackle, and you know he's your starting guard. So it's a lot of shuffling, and you know, it's Kudos to Dan Rauscher for getting him ready to be able to take, you know, those different roles and spots. Back into the playbook for play number four, coverage confusion. We saw a number of times yesterday where guys went out on the same page and it led to Pittsburgh touchdowns. It starts with communication, particularly when you, you're going to play a team that has elite receivers and an elite quarterback the way that they do. And, I mean, he is able to find different guys at different times, you know, just because uh, it's almost like – playground ball at, at some point because he's able to extend plays and it's not routes that that are common routes yes the initial route may be something that you've seen but after that they just go and go and create and run and so you've got to do a great job of communicating yeah both antonio brown touchdowns if you watch it was clear cut confusion uh, in the coverage the first three yard uh, touchdown we're on it was between Lattimore and pj williams pj williams stayed under and i think uh, Lattimore thought he was going to pass antonio brown off to him it didn't happen and obviously on that last touchdown, and look, Marshawn Lattimore got toasted on social media uh, after he gave up that touchdown to Antonio Brown. But if you really watch that play, Deuce backed me up on this. Uh, it looked like Kirk Coleman was too tight. They were playing some sort of cover two coverage, and he thought he had help on the inside. And you just see, once you see 29 running, just trying to catch up with uh, 84, you knew it was over. So there were some coverage issues, but look, that was one of the best wide receiver cores they've faced all season. Yeah, I agree. You know, that's going to rank up there with Evans and uh, Deshaun Jackson up in Tampa Bay. But Tampa doesn't have the quarterback. Uh, you know, he's not Ben Roethlisberger. And on, on that touchdown you talk about, you could go, you can look at the film. Marshawn is playing outside. He's expecting inside safety help from Kurt. And I, I just said uh, it was the right play call. I mean, because it was inside release, release right there. And that's safety. He, he He's expecting safety help. He, he, he was too tight, yeah. too, too tight inside. And, you know, it's just it's unfortunate but it's something that you have to learn from particularly when you have those elite receivers back into the playbook for play number five home for the holidays five and oh at home in the playoffs under sean payton any reason to believe this team is not going to be seven and oh once this little playoff runs done it's football, and it can obviously yeah. happen. Anything can happen on any given Sunday. Look how hard it was in 2009 to finally get past the Minnesota Vikings. It took them five quarters almost uh, to get there. So nothing comes easy. It's going to be hard. I would expect 
uh, a major challenge from whomever they play in the divisional round or if they get to the NFC Championship game. But I'm not going to go against history here. I like the Saints' chances. All the numbers look great, but you still have to go out and play the game. I mean, I think you, you can't take for granted the opponent that you'll be playing that will come in. They'll have a game under their, be their belt. I mean, so you just have to defend home turf. Do you worry about having so much time off, getting out of sync? Obviously, you want to rest legs and keep guys healthy, but that, that's obviously the concern for any team. Think back to 2009, there was a concern about keeping guys healthy for those games. No, I don't worry about it. I think the health is probably the most important part for this team. You know, just because they've been together, you know, yes, you have some young pieces that you kind of have to keep that focus on as far as understanding how tough it is to get to this point. But, you know, if this, if this group is healthy, you know, the rust, they'll, they'll be fine. All right, coming up, the Saints have stifled a few key fakes on special teams. Find out who the unsung heroes are from the pivotal play in Sunday's game as Sean Bazan breaks down the team. And we were flooded with questions on the New Look Final Play app yesterday. We'll make sense of an Eli Apple pass interference call and Taysom Hill's role in the offense next. You're watching the Black and Gold Review Show, sponsored by your Southern Quality Ford dealers and the 2018 Nissan Titan. All right, welcome back in. There are always a few plays that end up being the difference between winning and losing, and Sean's here to break down one big play from Sunday's game and win against the Steelers. It certainly was a big one. It's the play that got the national talking heads buzzing this morning. Was it the right call by Mike Tomlin to fake a punt late in the fourth quarter on fourth and five? Now, we can debate all we want, but the truth is it almost worked, as I discovered in my film study. Right before the snap, up back, Jordan Dangerfield goes in motion. Chris Banjo runs with him. Now count the numbers. The Steelers have seven players to the Saints' six. Advantage Pittsburgh. The snap goes to fullback Roosevelt Nix, and it looks like it's going to work. Watch the hole open up in the B-gap between number 44, Tyler Matakiewicz, and number 56, Anthony Chiquillo. The key to stopping this play for the Saints is David Anyamata. First, he reads fake, which is not easy to do from his position. And then he throws Matakiewicz to the side and is able to hit Nix just as he enters the hole. Had he not done this, Nix would have had a free release through the hole. That stop enabled Craig Robertson just enough time to fight off his block and make the initial hit. Banjo then alertly runs to the ball carrier and stops him about a half yard short. Now, had it been fourth and four, I think the Steelers may have gotten it. Heads up play by Anyamata. I'm not so sure the Saints would have marched the distance of the field and scored the go-ahead touchdown had the Steelers chose to punt it. I guess we can debate that. And look, that wasn't Peyton's call. It was Tomlin's call. And you take advantage of the situation. But I was surprised when it happened. But kudos to the Saints for, for executing and making the stop. Well, that's what you, you, know, that's what you prepare for. That, those are things that you have to look for and just, you know, I, I, I don't know if the Saints would have, have drove the distance, but I know they if they would have had to, you know, they, they knew they had to get some points, but they did come up with a big stop when they needed to. Big, big, and still a big play call. You're going to question it every time, Mike Tomlin. They needed to win that game, obviously. So now time to get to some questions using, of course, the final play app, the final word feature on the app. This from Frank down in Homa. When will Eli Apple learn to recover a receiver without drawing defensive interference? It will never be perfect. I mean, this is the NFL. You're playing some very, very good defenders. And, you know, it's really going to be a judgment call by the referee. Some guys will allow you to be able to get your hands on them and then be able to climb up. Some referees won't allow it. And so it's just understanding and knowing how much you can get away with. To me, you got to take this with him. I mean, it's just part of the package. He comes in, he's going to be handsy. Sometimes he's going to get away with it. Other times he's not. Sometimes he'll make a great play on the ball. Sometimes he'll make a pick. Sometimes he'll get flagged. But I think overall, at the end of the day, the Saints are better for better to have Eli Apple there as opposed to Ken Crawley. And to me, he's been worth it. And on that play particularly right there, if he turns his head around, it's not a penalty. Mm -hmm. He has got to learn to turn his head yep. because he's got great, yep. that's great coverage. He does an outstanding job of squeezing the receiver to be able to get him to the sideline. He's just got to turn his head there. Our next question comes from, An from Michael down in Angie, Louisiana. Do you think that Sean Payton will ever figure out that the Taysom Hill scheme is not fooling anyone anymore? And why try that trickery when your offense is moving the ball just fine? I feel like I wrote this question <laughs> a little bit. It's not about uh, who ran the play. It's when they ran it, right? I mean, that was their first drive after a couple of games where their offense had really struggled. They were moving the ball, finally getting into some rhythm, and they call this play. 
not obviously the great time, a great timing for that play call. Uh, really poorly thrown ball, really went way too high. Safety was able to undercut, make the play. Ted game was open if you watch it. I mean, he puts that ball more towards the back of the end zone. I think he makes the catch. It's a touchdown, and we're all singing his praises. But look, it's still about timing and when to fit Taysom man in the type of plays he's going to run. It just kind of is what it is right now with Taysom Hill. Sometimes it's going to work, other times it isn't. Yeah, and I don't think it's more of a trick you know, situation. I think he's part of the offense. It's just when do you want to use this play? And on that, if it's a better ball, that's a touchdown. You know, I don't, I don't mind the play call. You know, you probably question it because it was during that first drive. But outside of that, you know, he has a place in this offense because he's an effective not only runner, pass blocker, and, you know, we're still waiting for that first catch but, or as far as to be able to get into the end zone with him. But, you know, I think I, I'm fine with him as far as effective. All right, coming up, Teddy Bridgewater is more than just a dance machine. He's a quarterback, and he could be the Saints starter in Week 17. We'll debate the goals for Sunday's exhibition game against the Panthers as we continue to answer your questions next. And it's time to break out your camera and choppa choppa style. We want to see you do your best choppa style either solo, get your friends involved together, chop it out, and send it to us at pix at foxylive.com. That's P I X at foxylive.com. We could use it on many of our Saints related shows going forward into the playoffs. Choppa style, chop, chop, chop style. Watching the Black and Gold Review Show, sponsored by your Southern Quality Ford dealers and the 2018 Nissan Titan. Welcome back in. Let's get back into the viewer questions because we had a lot tonight. And this one's coming from Mark in LaRose. He wants to know, can Teron Armstead's injury be explained and what makes it so difficult to heal? Well, it's a soft tissue injury, and so it's that uh, pectoral muscle. And, you know, at first I thought it was scar tissue breaking. I mean, because that's what you'll have sometimes when you have it. And uh, originally I thought it was just a scar tissue popping, and he comes back in. But obviously you have to have the strength, et cetera. And so for us, and, and this is really any of us, Without seeing the scans, yeah. you, you're not going to know. I mean, we can guess all day. Yes, we know it was a pec injury. Yes, I knew he was going to have a brace on it to try to prevent it from, you know, popping or extending too far out. But, you know, to, to, to truly tell that we know where he's at with how long and what's the recovery, you're not going to be able to without seeing the scans, and that's the X-ray scans and our MRI. Look, it was a four-week timetable. He came back in six weeks, and the day, the game he came back, he reiterated it. I'm concerned. I yeah, mean, absolutely. how much longer can he really, I mean, it, how much longer does he need to heal? And when he comes back, is he going to be able to fully be 100% and go and not re-aggravate it? I mean, there's not that much time left, not just in this regular season, but in the postseason as well. Mm -hmm. Postseason as well. So I'm officially concerned about Teron Armstead's availability from here on out the rest of the season. That includes the Super Bowl run. Our next question comes from Steven and Slidell. He says, with this win over the Steelers, could the Saints activate the practice squad team and inactivate seven starters? No, you'd have to sign those guys off the practice squad, right? And then you'd have to cut players on your active roster, yeah. so that would not work. Because then you'd have, you'd, you'd cut seven players. Yeah. I, I don't, that's not going to work. Seven guys that you're going to want to have right. more than those inactive exactly. players coming off the practice squad. Yeah, and so this is the problem where you have, where you're talking about playing in the preseason mm -hmm. and playing now. In the preseason, you have 90 players. Mm -hmm. Right now, you only have 53 players. You have 46 guys that you can uh, have active on a game day. And that's why, you know, it's, it gets interesting when you talk about players being able to break records, you know, uh, I know Drew is less than, what, 10 yards to having 4,000. Mark needs 118 to, to get the rushing. Michael Thomas, I think he needs 40 to break uh, Joe Horns. Well, all of those guys, if they go, that's three guys that maybe from an inactive standpoint that can't be inactive. And so you have to have 46 active. You know, one, let's say, two players for sure that are going to be act inactive. That's Armstead, Armstead and Bushrod. And so now, okay, what are some other guys? Guys, and those are just, just because of injuries. So it's going to be interesting to see how they handle that. All right, let's get to our next question. This one coming from Vincent and Pontchartouli. says, will the Saints rest Drew Brees for the final game and give Teddy Bridgewater some playing time, getting him used to the offense since we really haven't seen much from him this year? Now look, uh, Sean Payton doesn't like this question. Uh, he's a little, <laughs> didn't like it in the press conference, didn't like it in the conference call this morning. If it were me, 
Number nine ain't seen the field, and I would make him inactive. I would let I would let this be the Teddy Bridgewater show, see what you got with him, let him execute the offense. He hadn't played in a while anyway, probably could use some reps. I am all for sitting number nine in week 17. And, and we haven't seen Teddy, but the coaches have seen Teddy. They've yeah. been around him, and they understand, have a pretty good grasp of what he can do. And so if they, they will put a game plan together, and, you know, we really won't know uh, whether Drew is going to go or not, you know, until later on. And so if it's me, I'm like you, Sean. I don't play him, but, you know, that'll be up to Coach Sean Payton. All right, coming up, the Panthers are sporting the longest losing streak in the NFL, and their backup quarterback took a beating against the Falcons. We'll preview a unique matchup of teams going in very different directions next. Watching the Black and Gold Review Show, sponsored by your Southern Quality Ford dealers and the 2018 Nissan Titan. Turning the page to Week 17, that matchup against Carolina, second time in a week. It's all about balancing staying healthy versus staying sharp with this game, right? Yeah, I definitely think so. And I think at the end of the day, you want to be able to stay healthy. You would love to be able to go out and get a victory. It would be 14 wins, the most ever in this franchise's history, which is important. But at the end of the day, it's about getting ready for the playoffs as well. I think it's all about staying healthy for this one. I can recall the game, I believe in 09, the season finale was against Carolina. In Carolina, they lost that game. Mark Brunel uh, was the quarterback. Didn't look particularly well, but it is all about staying healthy for the playoffs. Panthers have lost seven straight games. Why have they become such a bad football team after being, what, a game back at the Saints, back after week eight? Turnovers. It's a, it's a tale of two, two, two teams as far as turnovers are concerned. They're not able to rush the passer with their, court, with their uh, defensive ends and then not getting a lot of pressure inside, so it, it's exposing them to big plays. Much more Saints-Panthers talk coming your way on overtime tomorrow night at 1035. Same time, same place, Wednesday for game plan. And Sunday, the final day of the regular season. We know you know we've got you covered for that. 10 a.m. tailgate, noon kickoff. We'll wrap it all up on the final play at 1030. Until then, for Deuce and Sean and everyone at Fox 8, I'm Juan P.K. Have enjoyed. Thanks for watching. Enjoy you. Try that again. Thanks for watching. Our next newscast is at 430 in the morning. So you know that. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. From Fox 8 Sports, this has been the Black and Gold Review Show. Sponsored by your Southern Quality Ford dealers. Home of the best-selling truck 41 years straight. And the 2018 Nissan Titan.